Hello, everybody. I'm Melissa Gruden. This is our second storytelling evening. We're so excited to have you here. What you just saw a little slideshow of was a race that we hosted this past weekend, or two weekends ago, I guess, on the Alameda uh, Estuary. And we were uh, hosting with Ensignal Yacht Club and Island uh, and um, Oakland Yacht Club. So it was an amazing regatta. We had 65 boats on the water. It was a great day. The air was clear, the wind was good, and everybody just had such a good time. So we wanted to share you some pictures of what's happening in the estuary. We're so excited about this evening. It's amazing. We've got such great storytellers together. We've brought people in from Panama, from Hawaii, from Canada, uh, from Oregon, that's me, um, and um, a lot of Californians. So we're gonna ask you again where you're from tonight in a poll that we'll get to shortly. About a month ago, September 14, to be uh, exact, I was sitting in my RV uh, running the first women's uh, storytelling, the one that we had the Mother Nature theme. And we were definitely in the middle of Mother Nature's wrath because we had self-evacuated from the Southern Oregon fires and we were in Reno, Nevada. And all I had was that little burgee, that little magnet that I had put up on my wall. And um, we did the RV from Reno in the, middle of the, uh, in the middle of the parking lot. Tonight, I'm back in my house and I have one of our original IYC signs that was hanging in our yacht club. So I, I feel better that we've got something bigger from IYC to show. So we've got quite a night tonight. If you can show me in the slides a, a little bigger so I can follow along with that. Perfect, okay. So this is the partici uh, participation guide. You're all muted right now. We want you to participate by asking questions in the Q&A box and that's on the, um, the tabs below um, where it says Q&A. Um, the questions are gonna be monitored by the hosts and shared with the speakers after each presentation. So if, for example, Lauren is talking and you wanna ask her a question after she is done, if you would put your question in the, um, the Q&A box, then we will get it to her and we will be able to uh, help answer some of those questions that way. Um, the webinar is being recorded just like the first one. You can actually go on www.womensailingseminar.com and be able to see the first recording of Mother Nature. And then tonight's will be on there as well. Next slide, please. So here's just a quick look at our agenda. Here's our welcome right now. Um, we're gonna talk about our new logo. We'll show you that in a minute. We are gonna talk a little bit about our women's sailing seminar. That's from November 13 to 15. So that's coming up next month. We're gonna do the storytelling and a little bit of an open mic, have some Q&A, closing comments. And then we're gonna do something special tonight. It was really difficult to wind down last time after it was all over. I found myself sitting in this RV so hyped up because we had had such a great time for the first storytelling. And so at the end of this, we're gonna leave the session open for a while. And for those who wanna stay on and just talk and chat and ask questions and get to know each other, that's fine. And for those who think it's too late and they need to go, that's fine too. But we're gonna try that and see how that goes. Next slide, please. So here we'd like to show you what our new logo looks like. Our old logo is 28 years old. It looks something like this. We're going to something like this. So in the future, and as we go into November, you're gonna be able to see uh, this logo more and more often. Um, we're really excited about it and we really think it speaks to where we're going and the, um, the fluidity and the action that we want, the power that we want this to represent. Next slide, please. Our sponsors have grown as well too. I think a month ago we had about six sponsors and now we've got double that. We're pretty excited about these sponsors. Those of you who have attended our uh, Women's Selling Seminar before know that these sponsors give some amazing gifts to be raffled, classes, and uh, we're trying to keep everything pretty light to put into an envelope this year uh, so we can mail it to you if you're a winner. Um, but we know that this is a really great reason to participate in women's sailing seminars so that you have the opportunity to win some great prizes. 
Um, so these are just a few of the sponsors that we have this year. Next, please. So we're going to do two polls, same as last time, actually, because these are two really important questions that we'd like to know. The first one is, where are you dialing in from? And the second one is, how did you find out about Women's Sailing Seminar? So I believe that we're going to um, show the first poll right now, and then we'll do the second poll after that. And then at the end, we're going to kind of go up with uh, re review the results. Oh, they're both on one page. <laughs> OK. So let's do, please answer both questions. I'm disabled. I can't. She's disabled. Lauren? Host and panelists can't vote. I'm here. Okay, so I guess what we're hearing is the hosts and the panelists are not gonna be able to vote. I'm not a host or a panelist. And it looks to me like I'm getting to... Okay, um, I'm sorry, I can only work with what I'm seeing in front of me right now. So if you tell me where you're from, then I will add you to the poll. California. Okay. So I think everybody is seeing California. Okay. Well, 69% of the people are from California. And we've actually got 14% of the people tonight from the East Coast. Wow. We've got uh, people from other, which must be Panama and Canada. And we've got other spots in the US and we'd love to know where that is. So if you guys want to chat, just uh, tell us where you're, uh, where you're dialing in from. Um, we've got some people from the Pacific Northwest, yay. And then 31% um, of us are previous WSS attendees and 3% heard about this through email. And I don't know if I can scroll down and see the rest of it. Oh yes, I can, good. Okay, 28% word of mouth, 14% um, sailing club, 14% uh, um, Facebook, Latitude 38, other, awesome. That's awesome. I'm so thrilled that we have gotten such a round, um, you know, people coming in from so many different places. And uh, Ross, I hope you take a picture of this so we can uh, keep this and, and be able to use it. So um, we only have 35 people who voted. So obviously there were some people who did not get included in it. And I am sorry, we will work that out for next time. Okay, so we can move on now. I don't know if I can touch anything or Ross you're, or Ian, you'll make all this disappear. Still seeing it. Okay, and now I've gotten rid of the poll results, but I still see the Zoom poll. Could we go to the next page? I don't think I'm frozen. How are we doing? Can you hear me? Yes. I might be frozen. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm in again. How's everybody else doing? You can hear me. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, I'm going in and out. Okay, well, let's see what happens here. I'm, I'm not getting a notice that I have low bandwidth. We're all going in and out. Okay, I think Ian, um, if you could go back to the committee and make that large. Okay, so here's our committee. These are the people who worked so hard in order to bring this to you tonight. I'm not gonna read everybody's name out loud, but just know that we are all just so thankful that we can bring this out to you. And we're so excited to have such a great turnout. Next slide. So registration is now open for the Women's Sailing Seminar in November. It's gonna be November 13 to November 15. It's $80 early bird special and 100 after. You can go on www.iyc.org slash WSS or womensailingseminar.com in order to register. 
if you are hearing my dogs in the background, I'm going to get my husband to come save me and <laughs> the dogs be put somewhere. <laughs> so sorry. Hold on. I don't know why they're barking. Okay. So this is our schedule for the Women's Sailing Seminar. I'm not going to read this all out loud either. We have such a busy night ahead of us. But know that Friday night, November 13, we're starting with the Racer Chicks and we're going to have a couple of great speakers. Know that Saturday, we're going to have four classes, but we're going to start with yoga. We're going to have a watercolor class in the afternoon. We're going to have beginners and uh, not class in the early morning. And in the afternoon, we're going to have seamanship and uh, another racing class. And after that, we're going to work with the raffle. On Sunday, we're going to have um, a pretty busy day, too. We'll have yoga again. We're going to have a keynote speaker is Bean Gifford. She is a blogger. She sails totem. And her um, blogging is called Sailing Totem. Um, she's an amazing speaker, and she spoke the first time as well. Um, then we'll have our four panels, and we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. So we have talked about this already. Let's move to the next page. This is why you're all here, storytelling. So we're gonna open up with Lauren Knoble. She is a past attendee of Women's Sailing Seminar. She is, uh, she's come back tonight in order to be able to share her story with us. She and her husband are currently, they say prisoners, but I'm not sure Hawaii is really prisoner material. So she and her husband are currently in Hawaii because of the pandemic. And Lauren's boat is in Mexico. So they're a little far from their boat. And we're trying to work their way back to it. So Lauren, please take it away and uh, share your story with us. Fantastic. Well, I'm gonna take a deep breath and try and keep it light because my nerves are like this. So this is the first and I'm just gonna dive in and answer the very first question uh, and the first person to answer the poll. The very, uh, how did I find out about Women's Sailing Seminar? Um, I don't know if you have that slide to post, but it certainly would be lovely to show. I picked off a flyer from our yacht club's um, bulletin board and said, I'm finally going. So this was the reminder to me to actually sign up and get into the seminar. So that was my introduction to Women's Sailing Seminar. I really wanna thank everybody at Island Yacht Club. The women that are there are amazing. The seminar was amazing. Everybody should go. I'm just so honored to be here to speak along with so many other accomplished sailors with far more experience than I have, in my opinion. <laughs> a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in the warm waters of Hawaii in the early 60s. Uh, my dad was a big wave surfer. My mom, natural beachcomber. All the right ingredients for making me the water girl I am. Island life taught me clearly pretty much to love the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, the rain, the seas. But more so, I just learned how to be self-sufficient. So my professional life has been consumed with the practice of veterinary medicine for the last 30 years. I've owned three practices in the Bay Area that consumed me. So about 10 years ago, when my husband Mark and I uh, decided to get our first boat together, things really changed. Enter Windchaser. Windchaser was a Cal 229. I was in my late 40s. I took to sailing like I never left, never left Maui. My, clearly my water girl roots soaked up that bay. Bay sailing out of the Berkeley Marina was really my norm. That's where I learned. Uh, we were at the Berkeley Marina, five minutes of leaving your, your slip, your boom into the slot. That's where the wind just comes gushing out. Um, I don't know if you can see the picture of the slot there for me. Um, <laughs> it, there you go. This, it just gusts and gales and it's just pretty natural. I didn't really <gasps> Initially enjoy tacking directly into those steady winds, but I learned to enjoy the challenges that the bay gave us. I came over my fear. I got con confidence, but really, you know, more often than not, we were just so lucky to enjoy the beauty of the bay. We escaped the rat race of the city around us and just saw, I mean, this is sailing around San Francisco. Zarna, we all know it's just absolutely gorgeous. So after reality hits, sailing's become our passion. We're given the opportunity to acquire a new boat. Her name's Dragonfly, Canadian built CNC 38. We trucked her out from heated storage in her little bed in Maine, um, a kind of a gift from a family friend that we'll never forget. We refitted her, refined her, and sailed her mostly as much as we could in the bay. 
to see, to have everybody enjoy this, this wonderful boat we had. She actually opened her eyes to the possibilities of really going long range cruising. And at, by this time, a couple years down the road, Mark, my husband was on the ladder at Berkeley Yacht Club and it became clear that time was passing us by and that we better change our mission in life. And his was pretty clear and mine was as well. As soon as he survived Commodore ship in 2017, <laughs> immediately hit the golden gate, go out, turn left. And our goal, New Zealand, who knows if we'd make it or not, but that was our goal. And that's actually the day we left, heading out the gate. On November 1st, 2018, I had sold my practice. We really did it. I couldn't believe it. We left, we got to go. We had an ambitious plan that was really for us to hit New Zealand. However long it took, we'd get there. The boat was sold when we got there. So we didn't really have any fears of what when we got there. We called this our shakedown cruise, our litmus test, a double handing. Could we hack it? Do we love it? Questions go through your head. How will you take care of yourself, your land loving responsibilities, your family, who will take care of us? There are really too many questions to answer. So who knows, we'll just go on and forget it, just go. That was the main thing. So the adventure began amidst the trepidation of a lot of family and our friends in, in the Berkeley world. Their questions, we'll never return. You're not ready to go. The boat's not ready. We were too old. We don't have enough experience. Oh, you've never raced pack cup. Come on, you gotta do all these things. We don't have a bimini. We don't have our solar panels. They're on the boat. They're not installed yet. I think you kind of get it. You know, you just had to bury your fear, quit overthinking things, trust in your strength and your partner and ingenuity and just get gone. We, why wait till you're really ready? I think that's the adage that everybody really knows. So the adventure begins. For every challenge that we were presented with, we double handed 90% of the way down the coast and I'll have a gazillion stories there because that really was the breakdown cruise. We had so much fun. We really enjoyed the entire coast of California. So it took us a year and a half to go all the way to San Diego. We kind of became commuter cruisers. We leave our boat in different locations and bring our car back and hang out and just continue on down the coast. So our, we just didn't want to miss anything. Harbor, critters, people were just having too much fun. Our revised plan really worked. We got to share our boat with a lot of people, our family and our friends uh, and just carried on. So eventually we made our way. Um, I think we're a little out of sequence, but that's okay. So we, uh, we cruised, what happened to the, the boat is in first Christmas was in Ventura County, we summered in San Pedro, we sailed Catalina a lot. Um, we were blessed to be a part of the 50th uh, year Transpac Race Committee. Um, thanks to our host club, Los Angeles Yacht Club. I got to join Women on Water with Marie Rogers. It was fantastic. I actually enjoyed LA and that's a little crazy coming from this Maui girl, Bay Area. I, so it was pretty cute for us all. So we were getting closer to our departure time of October, November, um, but unfortunately we got sidelined by some family issues. Um, so we just had to put it off and button up the boat and deal with things. So eventually we found a window um, and that's the San Diego. We got to San Diego finally in December and oh, wait, it's Christmas. We still have to go home, button her up. But what we really realized is that we had become nomads, that we were having more fun being on the boat going here and there than anywhere else. So long and the short of it, we finally this is where the real adventure started for us. Mexico, you can see it. It's right there from San Diego. It was really cold. We just wanted to get gone. And after doing a couple of things to the boats, we finally left on February 3rd. It was, and this is February 3rd, 2020. We left at sunset for, on a super chilly, terrific overnight sail. And we watched Tijuana light up as the sun faded. It was just gorgeous. That's our sunset going out. And we arrived right in Ensenada as the sun rose. This is coming in pretty cool early in the morning. So of course we had to spend a week in Ensenada. We had to chill. We had to do fun things. We went wine tasting with our friend Rick. Um, we visited Guadalupe Valley. We provisioned, planned. And then I just get obsessed with planning 
uh, my safe lay points because it's really just Mark and I from here on out. So my trusty Garmin, this is, these are all of my lay points that are there just so I'm ready to lay in if we ever need to stop. My husband, Mark, never asked me about my plan. He just kind of leaves it to me knowing that the wind will tell us where and when we want to go. We're kind of prepared to be off grid for two to four weeks knowing that this is most likely our only passage. I don't want to miss a thing, kind of like our whole trip down from San Francisco um, through California. So our first leg was simple. It was supposed to be a four hour sail to, uh, to Bahia San Tomas. The first three hours were absolutely stunning and gorgeous. 10 to 12 knots, perfect sailing weather. We had our big A drifter out. We were zipping along. But the next three hours just turned into uh, mm. unpredicted 30 knot winds. So we blew past our first anchorage, no way. Four more anchorages go by. We resign ourselves to our first passage is gonna be 24 hour overnight. And we end up in Bahia San Quintin, absolutely stunning place. So this is coming in in the early morning to San Quintin. We had a dolphin escort. That's what lightened my smile. That lightened my heart to see those dolphins as we came in. It was really neat. That place was peace and tranquil, tranquil and calm and it just made me feel so much better. So I quickly go to work again, looking at possible anchorages for the next day's passage, we get to sleep in, oh, I got the video of the, yay. <laughs> um, this is San Quintin. You'll see it kind of wrapping all the way around here. Um, so I do, I go to work with plotting my anchorages because that's what I do. I just sit and look at the weather and everything. And um, the next slide, you can see all the, uh, there are like one, two, three, four, five anchorages at the top. And you see that dot in there before we cross the bay. Every yellow dot there is an hour of passage. Mm -hmm. So we make it to the most, uh, the furthest anchor, which is right there in the middle of that hook, which is Bahia Blanca. We anchor out without any issue. That's where we're headed towards that little X out there. Uh, and I was wanted to deploy an anchor buoy uh, marker just so I could try and plot my, just look at for accuracy with my handheld anchor watch programs. I just want to get a better idea of scope and play and that kind of stuff because we've done a lot of mooring and a lot of um, uh, harbor uh, stays when we were in California. So it's kind of the light side in retrospect. I really can only share the rest of the story with the levity of how hard I had to dig deep to get the next to get going after this next little episode. So I'm working on the passage to navigate through Cedros um, Island and we kind of figure out that we have got to make it from that upper point past the island through the Canal of Dewey. And that means we have to leave at midnight um, or one o'clock or two o'clock to arrive at Turtle Bay by uh, before dark. So uh, mm. we are rocking and rolling. We pull the anchor, uh, Mark and I, he, He's on the bow, I'm on the stern, and he tells me, put it in gear, go forward, and chukunk, the engine totally dies. And I try and start it again, and it dies. So you can see the anchor swing um, slide there. I just was so proud, we're doing great. Okay, maybe we're gonna just get on out of here. And you can move to the next slide because it kind of shows what happens because hmm, what could have happened? It's pitch black outside. There's no stars, there's no horizon, there's no life or light. Uh, so what clearly the anchor is not all the way up. The buoy is nowhere in sight. So oops, you guessed it. We definitely fouled the prop. So mm. my brain goes into emergency overdrive as I'm trained to do, I clear the fear and the scare, like whoop, now what? Triage, pitch black, drifting towards shore, mild swell, not too cold, no one around, can't call for help. Plan A, deploy the stern anchor. See if we can wait till daylight. About an hour later, I look at my track and go, nope, we're drifting. This is not good. So I better think more about plan B. So plan B, <laughs> I have a new used wetsuit. I have a small scuba tank. I love the water. I'm a really good swimmer. I'm not afraid of big fish. And there's no better person on this boat to do this other than me. I already pretty much knew in my gut from the get go, the only way out is to dive in. No discussion needed. So the hairy part was now what? So I wrap a flashlight 
in Ziploc bags. I secure it to my harness uh, and a rigging knife and I jump in. This is diving in. Pair of garden gloves on my oxygen. I can see the anchor ball right up against the hull, stuck right there. And I can see the lead going down to the anchor. So I cut that free, hopefully it keeps us from drifting onto shore. And then I cut the ball loose and then I run out of air. Great snorkel time. So now I have to free dive the boat and cut away what seems like, oh my gosh, at least a foot to two feet of line that has pushed the, um, has just got stuck between the cutlass bearing and a cutting wheel that we had on the boat. So finally, finally, after about an hour of these ups and downs, I see the light of day and we're free. <sighs> So thankfully the engine fires right on up and I can just breathe and breathe. So I feel really light. I'm not really in my body. It takes me a while for the adrenaline to clear. And finally I get to sleep and rest. And Mark takes the boat at full on hull speed towards Cedros, understanding that we just got a huge haul pass from the gods of the seas. And all I can say is, thank goodness, I went all in and I came out on the other side. So wow. for you, for everyone out there, I just really hope that you can follow your dreams and look at things on the lighter side. When you get put in these types of situations, you'll figure it out. Don't overthink it, do it. You can dive in and follow your dreams. And I hope that with the support of all these women around you, you can move forward and, and realize your dreams. You know, look at me, I've only sailing 10 years. And I really thank and all the wonderful women that have taught me to sail, as well as my husband, who has carried me on through it. Um, mahalo to Mark and um, go follow your dreams. Thank you all. Wow, Lauren, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so much happened near the end. It was, it was just coming right at us. And I just, yeah. your frankness and, being able to tell us a story so that we can learn from your, from your adventure. I mean, I think that's what all we women sailors like to do is support each other and, and be able yeah. to further, uh, further our education and our experience. And know when stuff happens to us that it usually has happened to somebody else first, you know, and, and yeah. there's other yeah. people that you can fall back on and be able to, 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 to work through your fear. So you said yeah. something about um, just being able to put your fear and everything aside and just get into that like emergency zone. Like, how, how do you do that? What, did you doubt yourself while you were doing this or you just? I, I didn't, you know, it was really, I think it's my emergency training um, from medicine that I can just shift the gears. And I think everybody will do it in all reality because you have no option, you can't panic. It's not the right thing to do. You just have to act mm -hmm. and you have to think logically and clearly. Otherwise you will make irrational decisions. Did I think I could do it? For one second, I thought that I could die. But then I said, what, you know, I'm gonna not, if I don't try, then I don't know. So it all, it was, it was tough 40 minutes into it. But I just kept going at it. What a great idea. Yeah. If you don't try, how would you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, where are you You're right welcome. now? Somebody had asked a question. Uh, I'm on Maui. At my, my, I'm from this island. I'm with my parents. We escaped La Paz on March 20th, left our boat in a slip and just bailed because of COVID. So we're home taking care of family. That's nice. I'm hope to, get, could be hope to get back in a month. In a month, nice. Yeah. So, do you think that um, learning how to sail in the San Francisco Bay helped prepare you for your trip? Oh, by all means. Now, everybody <laughs> talks about that light air sailing is also the most difficult to sail in, and we did that too. So, um, it absolutely did. I mean, I still don't like rail in the water. I don't like to race. I don't like that kind of stuff. I prefer to sail to the wind and have a comfortable time of it. But um, I just, you just, it prepared you for wicked weather. So. Excellent. Can you good. just tell us one more question? And that is, um, did you did you fish? What did you do in order to get your food while you were out? How did you prepare for for that? I love to cook. I oh. over provision. I didn't 
you know, one of the best things that I was told by <laughs> Jolinda uh, at, at LAYC was, you know how to cook, you know how to make it something out of nothing, don't overthink it, just get your stuff and go. So to supplement by fishing, and I it never killed the fish. So when we caught our first bonita, oh my golly, it was hysterical. <laughs> it was so funny, but it was delicious. So yes, we fish. Uh, I provision, I, I'm not afraid of local foods. I'm not afraid of adventure cooking. I've, I've traveled all over the world cooking that way too on other um, vessels. So it's been fun. That's excellent. Okay, thank you so much, Lauren. You're we welcome. really appreciate this. And people, you could continue to write questions in to Q&A. We can ask Lauren, we can always text her. We know how to find her. So, so. Oh, uh, here is one question that Marie Rogers has. It's a good question. Did Mark at least pour you wine after freeing the prop? Oh, I got, you betcha. I got to sleep <laughs> for the next six hours and I got tequila. Oh. And lobster. <laughs> when in Rome. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Lauren. Excellent, really appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is going to be Zara Haimo, and she is actually going to be one of our panelists too um, on the Sunday um, Women's Sailing Seminar from Crew to Captain. So Zara is out on the bay at least two to three times a week. She has a bunch of people that she on her boat that, and the people she sails with, and um, she has some good stories to tell us, a little out of the ordinary, you'll see with her pictures that go along with it. So Zara, take it away. Good evening, everyone. It's really great to be back at the Women's Sailing Seminar. The last time I did this, I was teaching in person. Um, that picture of me with the mask <laughs> is what most of my crew see of me these days. Anyway, um, I've been sailing for about 60 years, 37 of them here on San Francisco Bay. I started out, as many of us do, on 15-foot dinghies on the Charles River Basin in Boston. Then I sailed a snipe on freshwater lakes near St. Louis. And for those who don't know, it's a really fast, fun uh, two-person boat um, with a planing hull that lifts up a bit out of the water. Um, when I moved to San Francisco 37 years ago, I started on a 30-foot Bristol. And that was the first time I had ever been on a boat with a cockpit you could sit in, an inboard engine instead of a, no engine at all, and a cabin with a head and a galley. Since then, I've sailed a 41-foot hunter, then a 36-foot hunter, and now for the last three years, I've had a 38-foot Beneteau named Pelican, which is Russian, as you might guess, for pelican. And that's a picture of her over at Angel Island. It's the only place I could get a shot of the whole boat. Hard to get it when you're on the boat. So my boat is rigged for safe solo sailing, but as Melissa mentioned, I usually go out with a crew of four to six friends. I think some of my usual crew is actually in the audience tonight. Um, we usually sail to a nice spot for lunch, then anchor a dock depending on the location turn on some good music, put out some good food, and relax for an hour or so before going back, sailing back. Over the years, I have never once lost anyone overboard, but I've rescued a few windsurfers and others in trouble in the water. I make a point to start each sail with a review of some safety instructions. Most importantly, what to do in case of a man overboard or anyone in distress in the water. One of the things I always tell my crew is the importance of not losing sight of the person in the water behind the waves because there are no markers in the water and we'll never find them again. And also the necessity of throwing a flotation device and that's a picture of the flotation device from my boat um, at the person's head, not close to them because if you throw it close, it will go far. But if you throw it at their head, you'll get it close enough so that it'll end up right by them. So on the morning of June 24th, 2018, a little over two years ago, my crew and I set sail from Pier 39 where I keep my boat. There was a lot of wind and tide conditions were favorable 
for us to go to Clipper Cove, a sheltered anchorage between Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island. There is a sandbar at the mouth of the cove, so it's only possible to go in and out of there at relatively high tide. And there's an aerial view of it. And we usually anchor right up against Yerba Buena Island, the part that has a hill with the Coast Guard um, lookout station on the top. We anchored close to the beach to get out of the wind, opened up the table in the cockpit, spread out a potluck feast for our lunch. A couple of the guys decided to go for a swim. One of them jumped in from the top of the arch, and there he is. But the water was so cold, they both came right out. And here's the other one looking back out at the water. I think he'd been in for less than 30 seconds. So while we were eating our lunch, we noticed a woman nearby on a paddleboard. She was across the cove from us um, wearing a bikini, but we didn't think very much about it. She also had a large dog on board with her. And they seemed to be happily paddling around across the cove from us. After lunch, we pulled up our swim dock and my crew went below to put everything away and clean up. I was on deck keeping watch because the wind had come up a bit, but mostly, to be frank, I was checking my emails <laughs> when I heard a loud splash. I looked up and saw that the woman was in the water, but again, I didn't pay that much attention because I assumed that she would just climb back up on her board. But repeated gusts of wind blew that board further and further and even further away from her. And she also seemed to be thrashing wildly in the water. I immediately knew what to do. I yelled at my crew to lock everything down and get up on deck fast. I turned the engine on brought up my anchor. I can do that from the helm on my boat. All this happened in a matter of seconds. One of my crew later remarked on how fast I got us over to the woman. He thought it was less than a minute after she fell in, and I think he was right. Once we got close, one of my crew grabbed our red flotation cushion, the same one I just showed you, and threw it at her head, just as I had drilled them. And I'm showing it to you again because in many ways, the flotation device was the hero of this story. It was then that we realized why the woman was thrashing. Neither she nor her dog had any kind of life vest or flotation device. And her dog was trying to climb up on her shoulders to get out of the water. Pretty smart for a dog. Since the water in the cove was still relatively flat and calm, we opened up our swim dock again to make it easy to get them aboard. The dog immediately ran right to the only dog owner in my crew who comforted him. The woman also came on board. She was very obviously severely scratched up from the dog's efforts to climb up on her shoulders. She also was very chilled heading towards hypothermia. We got a blanket to wrap her up. And this is a picture of her um, sitting with us in the cockpit while we're trying to figure out what to do next. We then learned that her dog was not really a dog at all. It was an eight month old pit bull puppy. No wonder he was so frantic to get out of the water. He was little more than a baby. I suspect he may have never been in cold water before in his life. And there's the puppy being comforted by one of the crew. Meanwhile, another passing sailboat had scooped up her board and paddle and brought them over to us. On shore, the woman's husband stripped to his underwear and swam out to us. But then he just sat down on our swim dock and did absolutely nothing to help. <laughs> and here he is sitting there without a care in the world. Then the question became, what should we do with them? There wasn't a safe place where I could easily dock and leave them off on shore. So I decided to get as close to the beach as I could safely, put their board back in the water, 
and let them paddle the last 50 or so feet back to shore. And so here we are putting the woman and the dog onto her board. That's the husband on the right, um, sort of helping. And one of my very skilled crew sort of running the whole show. That was a great idea, but no sooner was the woman and her puppy back on the board when she capsized again. The puppy had had it. He took one look at this repeat situation, gave her a look, if a puppy can have a look on its face, of absolute disgust and swam directly back to shore on his own. <laughs> the husband finally jumped in and he and his wife swam her board back to shore again. That's the last we saw them. She had made every mistake possible. Neither she nor her puppy. You were fine, okay? Neither she nor her puppy had um, a life vest or flotation of any kind. She didn't even have a tether to keep her board with her. She was wearing a tiny bikini, not exactly the best choice for the cold water of the bay even in the relatively protected cove. As you may remember, both of my crew who had tried to swim were out as fast as they went in. Neither she nor her husband ever thanked us for the rescue. Neither of them made any effort to get any of our contact info so they could thank us later. So we all agreed that given the option again, we'd gladly rescue that innocent puppy. <laughs> but we'd leave the woman to fend for herself. <laughs> so when we um, had dropped them off, we set sail again. And on our way, we passed by the Bay Bridge Troll to pay our respects and give thanks for a safe ending to what could have been a much more difficult situation. And there should be a picture of, oh yeah, the troll. There he is. Thank you. Uh, by then, the wind had come up to summer afternoon levels, mid to high 20s, all the way back. A lot of fun sailing. And on our way out, we passed by this ship at anchor. Um, maybe the name was meant to tell us something after the adventure we just had. <laughs> Harmony? I don't know. <laughs> and we ended with a beautiful run back to the city in Pier 39. All's well that ends well if you want to quote the bard. And that is the end of a interesting day on the bay. Um, not quite what we'd expected when we set out that morning, but uh, definitely showed that my crew does listen to me when I do man overboard drills at the start of every sail. It's a story worth telling, that's for sure, Zara. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's just great. I mean, that's it. You get on your boat, you leave your dock, and you really don't know what's going to happen when you're out there, and you got to be ready for anything. Some people might not know a lot about the troll. Could you tell a little bit more about the Bay Bridge troll? Sure. After the 89 earthquake, um, at the place where the trestle part of the bridge broke, the iron workers had an artist who used, I think, some scrap metal from the, the repairs and made a kind of troll figure that they put up under that part of the bridge. But when the old bridge was torn down and the new one was put up, they decided they needed a troll under that bridge as well. And I think the one that's there now was made for, especially for the new bridge, but it's similar. And if you want to know where to find it, it's probably easier if I show you. But um, if, if you go east of the um, tall tower that holds up the new section of the bridge. The first support east of there, on top of the cross beam of that support, on the south end of the concrete between the cross beam and the roadway, there's a tiny three foot tall figure, which is why the picture I put up was a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And he's standing there looking south. There he is looking south. He's on the concrete pier. The roadway is the white stuff you see above him. And he's three feet tall, which means he looks like about a quarter of an inch tall from the boat. But you can see him. Easiest to spot him against the white underside of the bridge or against the sky. Absolutely. He's, 
do something else. Okay, I have another question to ask you. Um, <laughs> this is a good question. What's your trick of getting into Clipper Cove? Ah, so as you go in, um, there's a, um, first of all, you wanna go in at high enough tide. So look at your tide tables. Do not go in on a, on a decreasing tide because you're gonna spend several hours there waiting for the tide to come up again. But if it's a high tide or near it for the next hour or two, um, you'll usually be able to get in and out with no trouble. And then there's a pier at the entrance. There are often barges tied up there. If you sort of hug that pier as you go in and then cut across when you get to almost to shore on the other side, you'll get across the sandbar without any trouble. Thank you. Okay, I have one more question to ask you, and that is, what kind of a finish is that on your swim dock? It is gorgeous. Swim dock. Um, the whole boat has a kind of um, peak, and that's teak. That's teak. Wow. I think that because it's not exposed to the sun very much, that's why it looks so so good. Because the um, finish hasn't been faded by the sun. What you see on the top step there is yes. is, is faded by the sun because it's part right. of the boat that's exposed all the time. We definitely, our teak on our boat looks like the top step of yours, that's for sure. Yeah. Has a lot of exposure. Any other questions for um, Zara? Thank you so much for your story. We learned so much on so many different levels. And really, it's great to know that a boat like yours is out there on the bay, willing to help and, and step in. And, and thank you so much for being have, with I us tonight. I have some other rescues as well, so. Ah, okay. Well, we'll hear about that another time then. <laughs> Thanks, Zara. Okay, our next speaker is going to be Joanne Bond, and she comes to us from Canada right now, but her boat is in the Yucatan in uh, Progresso. I'm sure she'll tell us a little bit about that. I love how she describes herself, a wanderlust, inquisitive adventurer, curious, with, uh, curious partner, with her curious partner. And so, um, Joanne, I... Can you hear us? Do you see us? Yes, I okay. Do you, do you hear me? We do. It's a little, you know, we got that vibe going on, but let's see how this goes. Okay. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. Hello, friends. I'm so happy to be with you today to share some of my seafaring and related experiences. But before I dive into those depths, I'll take a few minutes to thank all of you for your interest and the opportunity to bring my outlook to your forum. With the multitude of events that the 2020 has presented to each of us, our own emotional mindsets have been similarly taxed. And it's with this, mind, with this in mind that I hope to present my talk with an inspirational and an uplifting outlook to some of the, my journey towards the sea. Truly, it's an honor to speak to you. And with just a few of the August moments that my sailing life has awarded me. So welcome aboard to embark with me as I relate some of my remarkable heartfelt rec recollections I treasure that inspire me to continue along on my amazing adventure. I am Joanne, the lifelong partner and first mate of my soulmate, my husband, my friend, my captain, and, our, and he's the captain of our beloved 33-foot Al Mason steel sailboat. She, Bridal Wild, this sleek little vessel has so unambiguously navigated her way into our heart with so much loving power and exactitude, likened only to the overwhelming joy we feel at, at the, as if she were the birth of one of our children. We love her, we love her. I am a sailor. I did not know this about myself for well over 50 years. I knew I was always drawn to water, but I did, but it wasn't until our family returned to the Eastern Atlantic coast of Canada with retirement looming in our future 
that we were deeply encompassed and smitten by a sea spray. I fondly remember the day our daughter said to me, as her dad was edging closer and closer to his final days of work, she said, Mom, there's something up with Dad. What is it? And I hadn't been paying particular attention, so I promised to investigate. As, as we do. Secretly, he was nervous about how retirement might affect our busy, project-oriented selves. I suggested that maybe he might want to take some sailing courses, since, in fact, we did live on the edge of this waterway that we knew nothing of. Long story short, and about out of the blue, on a crisp, wintry day, 15 months later, my husband said to me, Joe, you're going to have to take some sailing lessons too. You're going to love it. My captain knows me well, and I him. And so it began. We had a blast. We had a blast to become certi certified in as many courses as we could fit in. And we started thinking about a vessel. We spent glorious, glorious, glorious hours touring our province, searching out all things resembling or connected to water power. At the time, we expected to locate our perfect vessel within the environment we lived in, but that was not the case. An experience in newfound sailing contexts have since assured us that many search the globe to find their fish, and so it was with us. We found Bridalwild resting proudly, patiently, on her cradle in a small town in Ontario, on the shores of that great lake. What we first beheld was a beautiful blue water boat, seemingly aching for a seabound voyage and somebody to help her get there. We were elated and triumphant and exultant. No words could really describe those feelings we had, the, the poor blessed fight. She'd been standing tall and wait with considerable attention, imminent, but within months, she was out. Old songs that we had met and befriended far more experienced and knowledgeable about the seas and boats than we were, encouraged us to run her retrofit projects ourselves. And in turn, the boat would open herself to us and we would get to know her. It was invaluable advice. We learned so much over the following years and, 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 and as we approached each and every project, from rebutting new stanchions, installing new electri electronic equipment, building sails, painting, epoxy and anti-foul hull work, replacing steel halyards for line, and so many other requirements we needed to drop our sailboat into the waters of Lake Ontario. Those same old salts reassured us that we had what it took to bring our new vessel back through the mighty St. Lawrence Seaway network to the Atlantic Ocean rather than truck or overland. And we heeded their advice and have never looked back. That incredible five-month voyage, bridal wild, and our reactions within it taught us more than we could ever learn in 10 years of sporadic sailing or on a weekend sails we spent with her over the next five years in Nova Scotia, her home port in Mahon Bay. That initial voyage was an enlightenment, a reinvigorating of who we were, a pivotal pivotal adjustment in our own sales, one we never imagined or saw coming, one we are grateful for and one we hold dearly. A particular incident on one of many over that particular adventure that left me with an overwhelming sense of jubilant emotion occurred when we were sailing, nestled in the water between two magnificent mountains on a remarkable sunny fall afternoon under perfect sailing conditions with no other human being 
no watercraft, no noise about when a pod of white bilibus whales surfaced out of the river, gracefully surrounded our boat as if to say welcome. I felt at that moment as though we were invaders in a hallowed, enchanted domain. The power was impossible, and these impressive, as these impressive creatures slipped away, calling us with goodbyes as they descended and we drifted past, mesmerized. This was a gift. Our arrival to the port we would call home for the next five years was also fitting. It happened in the diminished sun of a warm Thanksgiving day, a day we had much to be thankful for. The sun set not at the end of an incredible journey, but as the awakening of new navigations we would make through the remainder of our lives. Over the next few years, we learned more. We practiced our sailing skills. We read tons of sailing literature. We researched daily and we went to bed nightly dreaming of anticipated departure dates for our own long-term adventure. Once we made the decision to go, we sold our home, our farm, and we retired from both work careers and our landlocked life. We anticipated circumnavigation and dedicated a five-year term to our sailing plan. We had prepared mentally, we readied our sailboat, and we provisioned accordingly. Saying farewell to those who loved us and we them was difficult, difficult. And it was done with much highly anticipated trepidation. Then on a, the cool fall evening of October the 5th, 2016, together, we two wanderlust intrepid, coiled our lines as bridal wall pulled away from our home for the last time, beginning the journey of our lifetime. We had begun living the dream. The emotions of such an endeavor do run wild. They can rage and relax within split seconds, depending on the ever-changing conditions and experiences one relates to such a voyage. Many that we left behind were concerned for us. None of them were sailors. So we were conscious of their consideration. They needed to be kept informed of our status and our whereabouts. We decided I would update everyone together using the Facebook, Facebook platform and posted a running record of our activity and movement there. As we went, ventured further and further with the reporting of our live aboard lives as newbies to a seabound lifestyle, the profound lessons we learned, the remarkable experiences we encountered, the new relationships we developed with ourselves and with others, and the utter thrill of our opportunity. We began to understand and accept the fact that we were evolving. We had become sailors. Year one was spent traveling south along the eastern seaboard of the United States. By the time we were rushing through the waters of the East River of New York City, myriads of adventures, new friends and memories had come over, over our way. But we were all one of the few who would want to make their own way from their own vessel on their own time to sail respectfully by Lady Liberty and beyond. And who wouldn't want to learn that? And we did. We continued south to Florida using the ICW when necessary and sailing offshore when we could. Year two took us across the Gulf Stream to the Bahamas, where we explored Grand Bahama, navigated the banks to the Adipos, reached across the tongue of the ocean to Eleuthera, and further south to the network and sands of the Exuba Islands chain. Only a book would be space enough to recount the reward we were blessed with because of our decision to spend time there. Again, we are among the very fortunate few who have had, a, who have had the honor to spend a hallowed Christmas Eve on the Bahama Banks, 44 miles offshore, anchored in 12 feet of water, snuggled sleeping in their cockpit, watching the total stars above, and giggle 
as a ray tickles over your toes as it flicks, flickers in the bohemian shallow, intent on taking the concrete from my hand. We survived a five, uh, category five hurricane there and it proved much to us. Year three took us back to the Florida Keys to join up with our prearranged flotilla of beloved favorite sailing friends we had met, all of us meeting there to voyage together across another portion of the Gulf Stream to Cuba to sail her western coast and beyond. Cuba is not an easy sailing destination, nor for the faint of heart, but those who attempt her waters are rewarded with accolades beyond. The, the nine glorious months we spent sailing there are etched into our memory as nothing but another gift. Entry into Havana's Marina Hemingway, although alone is a historical entity, let alone one's introduction to the crews of, of sailboats coming and arriving there from all over the world. Year four led us to Mexico, where our experiences took us to heights we never knew existed. We overcame sailing crisis and found places to call home. We volunteered at youth delegate, uh, as youth delegate supports for the 2019 Nobel Laureate Peace Summit in Merida, working with delegates from every corner of the earth who like-mindedly want to find peace for the rest of us in, in this environment that we live in. Joanne, we are still also involved in your story, but just in the name of time, we have about another minute. Okay. Um, so much has transpired since we left that uh, on that trip in Bridal Wild. It, it has been an incredible, incredible piece for all of us that, that we have met. In closing, I know this is a this is a vagabond lifestyle is not for everyone. But if just if you have just the slightest of inclination, perhaps as they did for us, Mark Twain's words may ring true for you too. Throw off your bottom line, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade word winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. My captain and I will never regret doing so. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That's a beautiful picture. I just have a just a couple of thoughts and and one is for all of us sailors who are just find ourselves where we are and can't travel and our plans have been put you know um in storage for the moment i mean this just uh gets at my heartstrings that there are all these adventures out there and uh it's, it's all about the journey um thank you so much for sharing joanne i i just had one quick question and then we'll move on to Lindsay. and that is how did bridal wild get its name i'm trying to google it and i'm not coming up with anything um the people who owned her person their last name was bridal and when they were originally building their cottage the gentleman who owned the property was naming it. And because at that time, J uh, Idlewild Airport in New yes. York City mm -hmm. was being renamed to JFK. Right. And so he named his property Brightwild after that. And his daughter took that name for, uh, for her boat and it was from her that we purchased it. Nice, thank you. Thank you for giving us the dream to get back on the waters and hopefully we'll be able to do that again soon. And um, so thank you so much for coming on from Canada and the time difference and, and um, it was great, Joanne, thank you. 
Um, our next speaker is Lindsay. I'll let her pronounce her last name for you. She always, it always confuses me. And just a quick question, a quick story about how Lindsay and I met. Lindsay and I were in a sailing class together in Santa Cruz in 2016. There were four of us, two gals, two guys. And when we went around the room introducing ourselves, she and the two guys both said that they wanted to take off and travel around the world and they wanted to be captain in their own ships and they had all these dreams and none of them had a boat. And there I was, I had a boat and all I wanted to do was go from Santa Cruz to Monterey. And so lo and behold, there is Lindsay living now in Panama and she and her husband and her two young children have taken off, God, I want to think a year and a quarter, year and a half ago already. You got to hear Lindsay's story. She's amazing. So Lindsay, take it away. Thank you so much for having me. It's so fun to hear everybody's story and passion for sailing. And um, I'm going to jump into it because I definitely um, bit off more than I could chew, but we'll see <laughs> how far I get. Uh, so my name is Lindsay, and I am currently sailing with my partner, Bay and our two children. That's me. <laughs> and um, we are currently located in Bocas del Toro, Panama. Um, and then a little bit of background, which Melissa alluded to. I had zero sailing experience, and I took my first sailing course with Melissa in August of 2016. Then um, a month later, we hopped on a plane to Greece and we took a two week sailing course. I mean, not course, sorry, a two week sailing trip, which was the first experience I had living on a sailboat, especially sailing with kids. And it was the first time I'd been to Greece. Um, so that was a great experience. And then one month after that, <laughs> We uh, bought our boat over Thanksgiving weekend, 2016, um, completed the on the water survey, finalized the purchase, and then we moved aboard the next day. So <laughs> we were the ideal buyers. We arrived with duffel bags ready to move on. So um, we, we just fell in love with our boat. Um, our boat is a 1991 47-foot Tiana named Indago. And this is Thanksgiving weekend, my little babies. Mm. Um, that's our boat. This is after we had the hard bimini installed. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, <laughs> that's us sailing. So um, on our boat, we have, oh yeah, there's another shot of our our baby. <laughs> and there's one more. Can you show the next one? Thank you. That's in San Blas. Beautiful anchorages everywhere. Um, and so our crew includes Bay, who I mentioned. He is our engineer, our carpenter, and I call him the captain. And then there's me. Um, I'm busy all the time. But, uh, and Bay calls me the captain, and we're not sure if that's because I'm always planning or if it's because I'm bossy. But either way, <laughs> we both uh, um, raise each other up as the captain or defer responsibility as necessary. So um, let's see, the titles don't really mean much because really uh, the main requirements for being captain on our boat or the main job requirements for both of us include carrying children everywhere and stowing our belongings. <laughs> There's Bay carrying Carver, my little guy, and me carrying Carver, <laughs> and me holding Carver, <laughs> and me swimming with Carver and holding Arden up to the best of my ability. <laughs> Oh, he's saying, I'll help you out. Mommy, carry me. I'm so tired. So that was a huge hike on Saba, an island in the Caribbean. And it's amazing. And I think he was only, um, I think he was like two. 
but he made it. Um, anyway, and then we have Arden, who is uh, almost the captain. She makes sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Ma she remembers everything. So she makes sure that the orders are being followed. And then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> peeking through the hatch <laughs> oh dead fish <laughs> and then we have Carver who is our youngest crew member <laughs> he's in charge of entertainment <laughs> and um, checking to see what he can break really mostly uh, so now Arden is eight and Carver is six Um, so I was trying to think of like what story I might like to share and uh, I thought about all the beautiful things that are involved in sailing which is what comes to most people's minds you know empty bay nature sunsets um, hikes donkeys I mean nobody thinks of donkeys when you're sailing but if you go to Bonaire you will think of donkeys um, and then I thought about the injury. Oh, there's, oh yeah, paddle boarding, snorkeling. And my favorite are turtles. <laughs> <laughs> that was in St. Bart's, which was magical for me. Um, and then I thought about the next thing that came to mind were all the injuries because we get injured. There are so many bruises and scratches from um, <laughs> propellers and broken or stubbed toes. I mean, it happens. Um, and let me see, I think there's one more slide, but it's my foot being x-rayed because I drew there was a wake and that knocked this huge chopper block on it. Anyway, I survived. And then the other thing that came to mind, of course, is the weather. Um, big winds, hurricanes. We've had, we had to deal with that right after we bought our boat. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> and then one video I wanted to show was what I call the docking fiasco of 2019. This is not my proudest moment, but it's hilarious. So let's see if we can play it. What number is that? Well, we're gonna know a lot about Bay's injury, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, he says he doesn't see the video. Oh, it's number 68. I don't 68. know if that's helps. Some of our storytellers are rather overzealous with their pictures. Number 68. That's me. <laughs> we promise you won't have to see 68 pictures. <laughs> no. OK, well, we can skip it. Okay. But um, if you're ever docking in Curacao, oh, here we go. Go, 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 Oh, dear. <laughs> So my voice reached a new octave. I was like, Bay, reverse, reverse, reverse. <laughs> there was a current. The cleats were really far apart. It was closing time. We had to get into the um, uh, immigration office. It is a long story, but um, yeah, ran into the dock. No big deal. You gave those people um, on the bus a good laugh. Yeah, I know. That was a little embarrassing, but now I think it's just funny. So, And then it reminded me of um the story i want to tell you which i refer to as gone with the windless <laughs> saga <laughs> so in the summer of 2018 we were pulling into a bay called saint anne in martinique which is enormous and packed with hundreds of boats and there were like 10 jet skis zipping all around and um it was dusk and we were just looking for a place to anchor um no big deal normal day so I'm at the bow pointing out all the Coke bottles that are floating in the water as buoys and looking for a good spot to anchor. Uh, we found Sandy Bottom and I began to lower the anchor 
using the windlass. And then suddenly the chain started feeding out uncontrollably, followed by a really loud thud. And then the chain just pulled tight, stopped moving. And of course, I yelled the obvious back to Bay, which was, something's wrong. <laughs> and uh, so um, we were in 25 feet of water and the anchor should have been on the ground at that point. Um, but because it was fouled, we started to drift because there were 20 knots of wind. And anyway, so I took the helm to navigate around these Coke bottle buoys and the boats that were already anchor anchored and probably having dinner. And um, Bay quickly figured out what was going on, attached a snubber to release the tension on the train, uh, the chain so that we could at least drop it and anchor for the night. Um, so then let's see what happened here. Oh, uh, well, we figured out that our problem was this, our windlass. Beautiful. That was our windlass. We had no idea. It had been maintained from above, but not from below decks with the housing removed. So what it happened here is that the bracket that was holding our windlass on had completely, uh, it was holding our windlass to the capstan completely disintegrated. So this was hanging down into our chain locker. Um, so uh, anyway, that night was okay. After several attempts, we motored around in circles, um, finding, you know, trying to anchor by hand. It took us like four attempts. So Bay and I are pulling up the anchor and lowering it by hand. We were tired. We went to bed. Um, we needed to pick up a visiting family member, Bay's stepdaughter, Shaden, in St. Lucia in two days. And her flight to leave was in Grenada. So, and that was 10 days later. So we were thinking, Okay, what are we going to do? So Bay quickly goes around to all the chandleries in that area of Martinique, can't find a replacement. So we just say, we're, we're going to go for it. We're going to go to St. Lucia and pick her up. So um, we head to St. Lucia, realizing we, so we left Martinique and sailed to St. Lucia, knowing that we would have to raise and lower the anchor by hand for the next 10 days. Um, so that we could be in Grenada to send Shaden off on her flight. Um, so over the next 10 days, we had a great time um, raising and lowering the anchor by hand. We <laughs> sailed to Union Island, the Tobago Keys, Kariku, and Sandy Island, which was the only place that had mooring balls. We were so glad we got a pass on the anchor uh, hauling. And we were feeling really proud of ourselves and our teamwork after you know these showing Shaden a great time on her you know vacation or whatever um and then it was time for us to head to Grenada um so we sailed south in the lee of Grenada so we were protected and then as we turned around the southwestern corner we were heading directly into 25 knots of wind and like six feet of swell. So you can see the little island at the bottom is called Glover Island. And we, so we made this turn and you can see where it gets shallow and light. So we were so happy and it was beautiful. We were looking at Glover Island because it was cool to be sailing between the rocks. And um, we went from being in, you know, a, Oh, 100 plus feet of water to being in like 12 to 20 feet of water, all white sand bottom is beautiful. Um, so while we're celebrating the fact that we're going to be uh, in our marina in about an hour, just in time for dinner, once again, we, I'm just going to ruin it here. We, we're going to miss dinner again. We're going to get there late. Um, so Bay and I are in the cockpit. Well, everybody's in the cockpit. And we hear this high speed, continuous, metallic rattling sound. And we're just like, what's the anchor? <laughs> so um, we look up there and we're going seven knots because we had dropped our sails when we started heading into the 25 knots of wind. 
we dropped our sails. We were motoring seven knots and all 150 feet of our anchor chain is paying out all over this area. 150 feet of road just paying out. By the time we stopped the boat, there we couldn't have stopped this this fiasco mid um, chain spill. So we um, basically the bow was crashing up and down. Bay once again hauls the anchor up by hand for the last time. Shaden stood amidships and is, you know, pointing the chain direction to me while I once again motor around in circles, trying to recover our chain. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, um, but luckily we went through that little cut in between Glover Island and mainland Grenada because we were in like 17 feet of water instead of a hundred feet of water, because I don't think, I don't think they would have been able to pull it up. Oh my gosh. Um, so, uh, obviously it all worked out in the end. Because <laughs> you are in Panama now. <laughs> we made it to our marina in Grenada. Shaden caught her flight back to the U.S. Uh, we replaced our windlass. Um, yeah, so that's... And now you're in Panama. <laughs> busting out the epoxy there. Wow, look at all that stuff. <laughs> There's Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we made a bunch of great friends in Grenada. The kids did too. So Lafar Blue, if anybody goes to Grenada, great little marina. They're our friends. <laughs> and um, I guess, uh, what can I say? What happened? Oh, so we had the anchor tied off, just so you know. We had it wrapped around a cleat, but we didn't have a redundant, you know, backup um bridle for it so uh bay and i both blame the captain <laughs> for not having a backup for that anchor situation and that's my story you know what lindsay that is a great story and we are so happy that you, oh, now we get to see aiden do, Arden oh, do a dance that's the light side of sailing kids that's that's great. So you can hear more from Lindsay because <laughs> she's going to be on the International Live Aboard panel on Sunday, November 15. Um, so we hope that that's something that you're going to want to tune in for and be part of the Women's Sailing Seminar. So thank you, Lindsay from Panama and Joanne from Canada and Zara from California and uh, Lauren from um, Hawaii. We are going to have time for one more story. And then I have um, one, so I'll have Heidi with a five minute story. I have one woman with a one minute story. Then we'll just have one announcement, sign up for Women's Sailing Seminar, www.womensailingseminar.com. And then we'll keep the room open for a while if you guys just wanna hang out and talk with us. So Heidi, Heidi, Heidi is um, in Marina Village with me and, um, she has been a lover of the water forever, and she and her husband live aboard their boat. So Heidi, you want to take it from here? So try that again. Um, <laughs> my name is Heidi. I live with my husband on a Tiana 42, love Tianas, in Alameda. I was born and raised in Alameda and I've been sailing since I was five years old. So I've been sailing for 51 years. Uh, we've lived aboard for 11 years now and our goal is to circumnavigate. We were um, supposed to be leaving this fall but COVID hit and we are going to um, wait. We've decided um, to wait another year. We've waited this long. We'll wait another year or two. Um, I have a blog that mostly contains short stories and recipes because we're not doing a lot of cruising yet. Eventually my blog will hopefully be about uh, visiting some of those places that all the ladies before me talked about. So that's my dream someday and to bring my uh, grandchildren along with me. But I am gonna uh, shake it up to the lighter side now and I'm gonna read you one of my short stories. Um, I often write about uh, the water and it's fictional of course. So I'll offer this up to you. <clears throat> it was her birthday and she had gone for a morning summer sail alone. She dropped the anchor in a cove off her favorite beach at Angel Island, stretched out in the sunshine and fell asleep. 
she dreamt of pristine white sand beaches and clear turquoise water, delicate coral waving from rocky reefs teeming with rainbow-hued fish and dolphins playing tag with each other. She swam for hours in her dream, at ease with the sea creatures swirling around her and never needing to come up for air. When she awoke, the sun was high overhead, beaming hot rays onto the deck. She stripped off her shorts, revealing her one-piece swimsuit. She often swam in the bay, enjoying the brisk and salty water. She was a strong swimmer, but always wore a life jacket with a tether attached to the boat when she was alone. Climbing onto the swim platform, she gracefully dro dove into the water. Stroking upwards, she suddenly felt a sharp tug and the life jacket clasp snapped open and pulled free of her body. She didn't panic. She broke through the surface, took a deep breath and got her bearings. The boat wasn't far away and she began a slow freestyle stroke to the life jacket floating nearby. Just then a ferry boat roared past the cove, throwing a huge wave her way. She took a quick gulp of air and ducked under to swim through the wake. An underwater current tumbled her about and she felt herself being pulled into the colder, deeper depths. She struggled to find the way back to the surface and the sharp pain in her lungs let her know that she was running out of air. Her eyes searched for the pale light greenish hue of the sunshine hitting the water, but all she saw was murky darkness. She didn't have much air left and calmed herself to slowly exhale a small bubble from her lips, watching it float upwards. Now she knew which direction to swim. She was close to the surface when the tingly feeling started in her toes. She thought she'd become entangled in seaweed and reached down to free herself. Instead of skin, she felt scales. She gasped involuntarily, sucking in water. She tasted the briny saltiness of the bay in her nose and throat and then relief. Fascinating, fascinated, she exhaled and inhaled again, breathing underwater. Her, her body floated with the current as she discovered her legs had become a thin tail. Afraid to venture too far, she swam near her boat for hours, trying to wrap her mind around her transformation. As the sun began its descent over the Golden Gate Bridge, she reached for the swim ladder, wondering what to do. She couldn't stay in the water forever, could she? She, curly, she surely couldn't sail the boat with a tail either. Giving a mighty flip of her fin, she launched herself onto the swim platform and out of the bay. Once again, she felt a tingle in her toes and looked down to see the green scales sliding off her human legs. She scrambled into the cockpit in shock and awe of what had just happened. Shana spent the next week extensively researching what she had always believed to be a myth. She visited the marina every night after sunset, slipping into the marina for an hour or two and then returning to land. There was no way she was going to tell anyone. She would be locked up in a psycho ward. Mermaids didn't exist, plain and simple. She was sipping her morning cup of tea and contemplating her predicament when her phone rang and she saw the number of her older sister on the screen. Hi, Hannah, what's up? Hey, Shana, I just got off the phone and Lyft is picking me up in 10. Meet me at the marina in 30. The marina, you're here? Then she remembered. Hannah had made plans to spend the weekend on the boat with her before a work conference in the city. Oh, just kidding, can't wait to see you. We'll need to run by the store to provision before we head out though. I've been a bit distracted this week. No worries, sis, see you soon. And I brought my suit. Now what? Shana chewed on her bottom lip as she changed into her sailing shoes, trying desperately to think up an excuse not to go sailing. Her sister lived in Florida and sailed the Keys, but missed the exciting conditions in San Francisco Bay. The sisters always sailed together every chance they got. She wasn't getting out of this. The wind was brisk and before long, they were at Shana's favorite cove and dropped anchor. After laying out a spread of cheese and crackers and pouring a glass of wine for each, Hannah asked Shana what was wrong. They were closer than most sisters and often sensed each other's moods. Shana laughed, nothing much. I just realized uh, that I'm a mermaid. Really? Hannah laughed thoughtfully. Standing up, she climbed onto the swim platform and held out her hand to Shana. Without saying a word, Shana joined her. Into the cool greenish water they dove together. Shana's hands cleanly sliced the mirror-like surface of the water and her slender body followed. The now familiar tingle no longer frightened her as her feet and legs morphed into a single shimmering fin tail. It was still a strange feeling when the gills emerged Sorry. The gills emerged behind her ears and she trepidatiously took that first full breath of air, 
allowing her lungs to fill with fluid and her immersion with the sea to be complete. Shana heard Hannah's soft voice in her head. Welcome, sister. Bubbles of joy surrounded them as they flicked their tails and headed towards the Golden Gate and the open ocean. Thank you. Yay, thank you. What a sweet, sweet story. Just perfect. Just another lighter side of life. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi, so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Heidi? I don't have one. I just loved it from beginning to end. Thank you, Heidi. I, and it's so beautiful to see the lights of Oakland behind you and uh, the beautiful night that you're sitting in. Thank you for being with us. Leslie, um, can we get her on the, um, can we give her a mic? How about that? I think that might work. So okay. Leslie herself to me and uh, she had a great one minute story. And so Leslie, go for it. Okay, thank you. Hi everybody. Um, so my story is probably very similar to many people's stories, um, women anyway. Um, so my brother is 16 years older than me. And so he introduced me to sailing when I was a kid and on the boat and railing, which of course was scary. and. Um, so periodically through my life, but we never really lived in close proximity to each other, except for short times. So periodically I would crew for him and then I wouldn't, and then I would, and then I wouldn't. And so, um, it was one of those times where I was racing and I think we had, we were on a flying Scott 19 and it was just him and me. And, uh, of course, a, um, a six pack of beer. And so, um, nothing's happening in the race. It's one of those races where you're wondering why are they calling this racing? One of those kind of things. And then all of a sudden this gust comes up and we're moving. And so I was directed to not only drink his beer, which was like a huge beer, but drink mine also like pretty quick and also help do whatever he wanted me to do. Because at that point, we're not brother and sister anymore. We're captain and crew. And, you know, captain kind of gets a little bossy sometimes. So, um, so anyway, I drank that, his beer, I drank mine. And by that time, and he's telling me to do something with port and something with starboard. And I just stood in the middle of the boat and I said, you need to speak English to me or I'm going, going overboard right now. <laughs> so that he did. And reverse back so I, he could tell me to go left or right because after so many years of not having any racing or sailing i forget things <laughs> so especially after two big beers so anyway it was one of the reasons why i wanted to join women on the water at uh, the mariposa and also because his daughter my niece was the um, commodore and invited me and i went through a divorce and i figured why not so I'm really missing it. Um, and I've been thinking of taking your, uh, your, your class virtually. Our so, weekend. Thank mm -hmm. you. Right. Thank I think you you'll like it. <laughs> I think that's one of the things we love about the seminar is that it's taught by women for women. So we'll go through what the terms are all about and make sure you understand before you get yourself to the next level. It definitely seems to work for for us ladies, we gravitate to it. So one of the last things I want to leave you with before, please register for being part of our seminar, November 13 to 15, is this amazing Antigua class yacht regatta that might be going on March 31 to April 6. It's not 100% positive, but one of our event helpers is organizing a few day classic yacht regatta and information is just coming together. Um, you can find out more at www.renegadesailing.com. And it would be putting together a women's uh, crew on a gorgeous 100 foot old beauty. And um, it would be an opportunity to get to Antigua. I believe they're gonna, they're gonna open up Antigua sometime soon. They have a big rowing race that's supposed to go on there in December. Um, and be able to uh, crew with a bunch of women. It's uh, 
you know, just for more information, Martha will keep posting on www.renegadesailing.com if you have any interest. So with that being said, I want to thank you for being part of our storytelling tonight. We love this. We think that this is a really wonderful way to bring women together and to share the love of sailing. And even with COVID, we're just trying to be able to stay as positive as possible and be able to continue um, our love of the water. And so we are virtual in November and that's the way we've decided to go, but we're hoping next year we'll be able to get back physically and be able to be together. So please ask us questions. If you um, have any, you know, stay on, talk to us after this is over, we'll be here for a little while. And uh, let us know what you think of tonight. Let us know what you think about coming back and doing something once a month with us. Um, be part of it. We're just really appreciative to see you here this evening. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate you being here and hope to see you on the water. Hope to see you at the next Zoom. Hope to share stories with you again. Have a good night. And thank you everybody who came from places far and, and near. And it's just go, so good to see your faces. Thank you, Melissa. Did a great job. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. And I'm staying on. So anybody who wants to stay on with me for a little while, let's have a talk. I don't know if I, I'm still here. Okay. I think I see a lot of familiar faces and I see 35 participants. So I'm hoping that um, we can, oh, 